awesome. Okay. Uh, so what we're talking about today. Uh, the topic of the conversation today is players are people too. Uh, and what we're talking about is how you can better engage the players in your game uh, with your company and actually stop treating them like dollar signs instead of people. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on myself just so you sort of know who I am, where I came from. Uh, I'm a senior producer at Big Viking Games. I've been at Big Viking for uh, give or take the last five years. Um, I started off working in QA uh, as well as other player facing roles uh, at DICE back in the early 2000s. Uh, and I've been in mobile and casual for about the last eight years. Um, one of the big things about me is that uh, I love games. I've loved games my entire life. That's why I've been in the industry for 13 years. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents would always say to me, you know, you go outside. You, you gotta go outside more. You can't just stay inside and play all day. So I would come home every day, and I'd go out to my bedroom, and I'd grab my Nintendo, and I'd grab my TV, and I'd take them outside and play the Nintendo on the back porch. Uh, and it's that passion that's sort of driven the last 13 years of my career, and that's sort of where I'm coming from today. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I did start in AAA back in the early 2000s. Um, a lot of QA work to start, uh, which is pretty much the normal production track for most people. Uh, and then I moved into production from there. Um, this is a look at our team at Big Viking Games. Uh, Big Viking is a company that was founded back in 2012. Uh, we just recently, uh, 2011, sorry, we both recently celebrated our five-year anniversary, uh, and this is our current team. Um, as of right now, I don't have an exact count today because we are in a lot of flux. We're sitting at about 110 people. Uh, when I started about four and a half years ago, we had uh, 11. Uh, so we've seen rapid growth, uh, and a lot of that is due to all of the wonderful people that you see up on the screen right now. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, and a lot, a lot of that growth is actually built on our commitment to creating relationships with our players. Um, from day one, one of our founding principles has been make fans. And we use make fans as a touchstone for the company, both internally and externally. Uh, what that means is that people who work for Big Viking Games should be very big fans of the work that we're doing. And the players that play our games should be very big fans of the work that we're doing as well. So this is just a quick look at Your World. Um, Your World's an online social decorating and dress-up game. As of right now, we have around 75,000 daily active users, uh, about 200,000 MAU. Obviously, the numbers shift month to month based on current market trends, but uh, that's our general average number. Uh, the game was actually created by one of our founders back in 2011, uh, and had been in operation for about a year and a half when it was sold off to Zynga. Uh, and after years of success, um, Zynga did a wonderful job with it. The game was no longer a priority for Zynga. Um, as the owners of the game, and it being a smaller title, they had basically bigger fish to fry. It wasn't turning the profit that they would want it to turn. It didn't make sense in their portfolio. Perfectly logical conclusion for a large company, but what they didn't necessarily anticipate was that they had a highly engaged, rabid, and vocal fan base. So what happened for us is that when they were going to sunset the title, uh, the players reached out to us, and what they said was, we love this game, can you do anything to save us? Because we are desperate to keep playing this game. We have years invested in social relationships and money and just friends and everything else. Uh, and so we did. So falling on deaf ears uh, is part of the important takeaway uh, for our talk today. Um, one of the things that happened when dealing with the previous owners is that players submitted numerous complaints over and over again. Um, but the developer chose not to listen to them, uh, partially because they weren't a priority and partially because they had their own agenda. Um, one of the major things that happened was security vulnerabilities are a very real thing. Anybody who deals with Flash games knows it's Flash. It has security vulnerabilities. What are you going to do? Uh, so malicious cache injection actually became a very big problem for the game. Um, malicious parties actually managed to get into the game put hard currency into the game, and at that point, what is the purpose of a player supporting the game? Why would you buy currency when you can just get it from some random guy off the internet for free, right? Um, one of the secondary results of that is that item quality took a dive, uh, and in a massive way. As a hugely content-driven game, uh, Your World depends very much on its content economy. Uh, so because the profitability of the game was diving, they were looking for ways to cut costs on item creation. One of the ways you can cut costs on item creation is outsourcing. This is not 
Uh, I want to be really clear that I'm not bad-mouthing outsourcing. There are a lot of great outsourcing firms in the world, but there are also very inexpensive ones, and you tend to get what you pay for. Uh, and that was the case that we had with YoWorld. Uh, so it started becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, as a result of the item quality going down, the malicious cast injection, players started to leave. When you have players leaving, you have less players supporting, you make less and less good quality items because it can't be justified monetarily. And this is where we get to the point of not listening to players can kill your game. Uh, it's really important to recognize that players have a voice um, and that they matter. They're really the lifeblood of every single game that we work on. Um, so listening to them is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, the lack of listening and response is actually one of the biggest reasons that Yoville, now Yo World, almost died. So players are people too. Um, Players are a lot more than just dollar signs and data points. Uh, one of the things that I noticed a couple years ago at GDC uh, was I went to a monetization roundtable, and the direction that the conversation went about players made me seriously question what I was doing with my career. Um, because there were people talking about price anchoring and psychological matrices and how you can trick players into spending more money. Uh, and I started questioning sort of what has happened to us as developers when every single person who got into games got into games because we love games. So why would we possibly treat people who share that love with us any differently than we'd want to be treated ourselves, right? Um, our players are unique and interesting people, uh, and they're all craving great experiences. And we can deliver those experiences, especially with the player's input. So how do we go about doing that? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that there's far more of them than there are of us. Uh, and that can be, especially at GDC, that can be a tough thing to realize because there's so many devs here. Um, but if we're putting it into context, uh, and just a little bit of a visual aid. So if we take a look at the size of the Yo World development team versus what we like to call the player team, uh, if you put them side by side, they look close to equal. But then you realize that there's more players, and there's more players, and there's not another slide full of people because I could do it for about another 100,000 slides. Uh, but there's so many of them, why wouldn't we take advantage of that great information and feedback loop that we can use to improve the quality of our games and improve the quality of our work? Um, so just to put the numbers into a little bit of perspective for you, uh, one tester in one day of work can do about eight hours of testing exposure. Uh, and we're not gonna get into ideal man hours or anything like that. Let's just assume that one person works eight hours in a day for the sake of simplicity. Um, but 50,000 players playing your game in the first five minutes can do over 4,000 hours of testing, right? So that, that's a powerful thing because that's 520 work days of testing in the first five minutes. So when you realize, one, you have people who are really engaged and really interested in helping improve the quality of your game, and two, that there's a lot of them, you can leverage that to actually help your business grow inexpensively while making the players happy because they have a voice in the destiny of the product. It's a really powerful thing. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what our first steps were when recovering the game. Um, Your World, as I mentioned, was a game that had some serious trust issues with the previous ownership, um, partially just due to lack of sunsetting uh, and players having sort of gone away in droves. Uh, so the first thing that we did when we took the game back was we sat down and we had a conversation about how we were going to re-engage this group of players and how we were going to have this conversation with them. What could we possibly do to re-earn the trust of people who felt like they had been abused for years, right? That's a very hard thing. So the first thing that we did was we sat down and we created what you see up on the screen there, which is our three pillars. Uh, and our three pillars for our players are number one, safe and secure, number two, community engagement, and number three, player-made experiences. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Safe and secure is fairly straightforward. When you think about the issue of malicious cash injection into a game, especially a game that is a virtual economy that thrives on the buying, selling, and trading of goods, it becomes very important to realize that the safety and security of that system is paramount. It's higher than anything else. If you can't sell people goods and allow them to support the game, the game's going to die. Secondarily, as a highly social game, it's really important to recognize that people who are playing in a social context, especially Facebook or any other social network, are deeply concerned about their own security and privacy. You need to be able to guarantee that security and privacy for them. Otherwise, they're not going to trust you and they're going to find somebody or someone else to go to. So the second of our pillars is community engagement. Also fairly straightforward, but very, very important. 
Um, we made a commitment to our players from day one that we would engage them in the conversation every step of the way, uh, that they were always going to be part. And what this means for us is that we've created uh, forms of feedback and different avenues of communication so that players always have a say in the direction that the game's going, which sounds very, very scary to a lot of people because who's steering the ship, right? Well, as a developer, you are ultimately steering the ship, but you have to remember that the players are the waves on which your ship crests, right? They are the crux of everything that you do, so you can't forget that. And finally, player-made experiences. Um, this one's a little bit more tricky in, in the way that it works, uh, but essentially, the way that Your World works as a game, because it is a design and dress-up game and a social game, Players rely very much on the ability to build things and show them to other players. It's very important for them to be able to activate their own creativity and show that to the rest of the people who are playing the game. Uh, so what this means for us is we create things uh, quite often feature-wise roughly 60% of the way. Uh, and we let players fill in the other 40%. So whether it be um, a feature that allows for user-generated content to be piped in and then shared with other users, or a first iteration of a feature that then goes out to players, gets feedback, and then we build another 20% based on that feedback, we bring them along the journey every step of the way. So in terms of regaining players' trust, um, the pillars were really important for us in that they created a touchstone for us. Uh, and that touchstone has been important for the last three years of owning the game, essentially. Um, we refer to them very frequently in our player discussions. We refer to them very frequently in our in-house discussions. Uh, when we're doing feature design, the first thing that we do is we go back to that first pillar, right? We say, okay, is this feature going to be safe and secure? Is it going to be something that we can guarantee there's going to be no security flaws with whatsoever? Uh, we've spent the last three years fighting off very persistent people uh, who it's, I don't know where they got this mission from, but it is their God-given mission to infiltrate the game. Uh, and in the last three years, we haven't had a single major security incident, which is a point of pride, and that's because we use these touchstones. Um, so every single time we do a feature, we ask, one, is it safe and secure? Two, how does it engage the community? Does it engage the community in a meaningful way, or is it just paying lip service to that engagement? And then, how is it allowing players to generate their own experience? Now, don't get me wrong, not every feature can generate experiences for players. You can't allow players to generate all of the content, but allowing them to generate a lot of it uh, is really important. Um, so, one of the important things to remember is that the industry is evolving, uh, and player expectations are not what they used to be. Uh, and that's something, uh, I, I've been around the industry for a while, and that's something that I've definitely noticed, particularly in the last five years, is that the savviness of players has gone way up. Players are on to us, especially when it comes to pricing strategy and how we approach microtransactions and things like DLC. There are goods and bads to this. Some players actually understand that, yes, Ultimately, we are running businesses and we have families to feed, and that's a great thing. But at the same time, they will jump on top of you if they feel like you're taking advantage of them. Uh, and the second thing here is that the marketplace is a lot noisier than it used to be. Um, this is a good thing for a lot of indie developers in that it's easier to be an entrant into the market, but it's harder to succeed in the market. Because there's so many people who are now competing in all of these spaces, whether it be the Google Play Store, the App Store, Steam. There's so many people doing independent development, which is awesome and exciting, but there's so many of them. How do you break through? So we need to find ways to cut through. And one of the ways that you can actually do that is engaging your players directly and making them part of the conversation. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we do to engage our players um, and get feedback from them in a meaningful manner that we can actually make use of. Uh, the bread and butter for us quite frankly, is the demographic survey. Um, how many people here have used demographic surveys in their game? Okay, so some, not a lot. Uh, if you've got a live ops game um, and you don't know the demographic of your game, you need to really seriously reconsider the way that you're approaching your players. Because if you don't know who they are, how are you possibly gonna know what they want, right? You're just shooting in the dark. Um, one of the really interesting things that we have learned by way of our demographic survey is that in your world, 70% of our players are actually female, 
which makes us have a very, very unique demographic. Um, one of the challenges, and lots of people can attest to this, is the industry itself does tend to be very male dominated, right? So how do we break through? How do we break that barrier of having a highly female driven player base while still making sure that our people are making things that they want to make? Well, one of the things that we do um, internally is we actually make sure that we actively hire as many females as we possibly can. And the reason for that is if you're dealing with a largely female base, then you should have as many females on the team as possible. The second thing that we do, and this is really important, is we never assume that any person fits a stereotype. So if you say, you know, 70% of the players are female, we need more female content, what does that possibly mean? Right? That doesn't mean anything. That means that whatever assumption that you've generated about what female-generated content is, is what you're gonna push on them. But what you should actually be doing is saying, okay, let's, now that we know that there's 70% of the players that are female, let's send out a survey to our female players and ask them what it is that they want. And then when they tell you, you can better deliver to them what they actually want. The caveat here being, our information is gonna be different than your information no matter what game you're working on. Every group of players is gonna be different and that's why you wanna to get to know them. Uh, the really important other thing here is that 70% of our spenders are female, uh, which means that they have a very powerful voice when it comes to driving the success of our game. Our female players are the by and large largest spending group of all of the players, uh, so their voice is very loud. So this is just for the, the visual learners in the group. Uh, it's sort of a re-representation in a quickly thrown together infographic to let you know some of the distribution data. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I'll just point out that the current demographic data was added a week ago. The infographic was made a month ago. So it <laughs> shifts a little bit. Uh, but we're sitting about 72% female players right now and 28% male. Uh, one of the interesting things for us is that we know that roughly 62% uh, of our players are in North America, um, with a further 12% being in either the UK or Australia. Uh, and what that means for us is that we actually know that our players are very driven uh, by, for lack of better terminology, Western ideology. They look at things through that lens, which means that we can deliver things using that lens. So how do we make that information matter? How do we use it? Australia Day. Um, so using demographic data, we learned that there's actually a significant of percent of players that are in Australia. Interestingly, when I say that 12% of the players are actually in either the UK or Australia, what we found out on top of that is 6% of our paying players are actually Australian. So Australian players really like investing in our game. Uh, and knowing that information allowed us to listen to feedback from players because players told us that for the last six years, they had been asking for some sort of celebration of Australia Day, but it had never been done because there never seemed to be any justification for it, right? It's a one-off, it's sort of a smaller group of people, why would we do it? Because, you know, nothing, there's nothing wrong with Australians, just why would we do it? Because we tend to, as developers, target our largest, our largest groups first. But your small groups can have a voice too, and this is an instance in which we found out, well, if 6% of the players are Australian and they've been asking for something for the last six years, the odds are very, very good that it's going to perform well. And even if it doesn't perform well, we have run an experiment and disproven the theory that Australian-themed content can work. Um, so what we did is we put together uh, very basic Australia Day bundles. Uh, and you can see that this is a tiered bundle. Um, now I will note, while I talk about how important it is to treat your players like people, you will see pricing strategy up there. It's, it's a reality of the business, so don't feel the need to call me out on it. Um, but one of the things that we found is that they actually responded really well to tropes. So we asked them, what's Australian content? And they were like, give us whatever you think is Australian. Um, they were very happy if you look at the platinum pack that they got a drop there, so that worked out really well for us. Uh, the next type of survey that we do is an engagement survey. Um, and we actually use engagement surveys to survey players on the effectiveness of how we're engaging them, which is fairly simple to say, but fairly difficult to do. Um, we have a number of different engagement efforts that we actually make use of for our players. Um, one of them is we do a weekly podcast. 
uh, where we just sit down and talk about the game, chat, and the players have an opportunity to get to know us better. We also run in-game contests for allowing players to create their own uh, content for us. We also run in-game parties. Once a week, twice a week, players can sit down with members of our staff and just hang out and game and socialize. Um, so these are all sort of our engagement efforts. But any of these things that you're doing, you need to find a way to measure and make sure that they're actually being effective. Um, one of the other things that we do for engagement surveys is we actually make use of quarterly report cards. So once every quarter, we send a report card out to the players and we ask them, based on these criteria, how are we performing this quarter? Are we better this quarter than we were last quarter or are we worse? And they won't hesitate to tell you that you're doing a worse job than you were. And it's a really good way of keeping you honest, right? And knowing what your flaws are. Um, and these actually have helped to drive our engagement significantly. One of the big takeaways that we had from one of our engagement surveys uh, was that players liked the podcast, but listenership was down, and we couldn't figure out why. The format hadn't really changed, the quality hadn't really changed, so we didn't know why. So our, our philosophy is generally, if you don't know why, then ask, because the players know, they're, they're gonna tell you. Um, we're very fortunate to have a highly engaged user base. So what we did is we sent out a survey and we said, what do you like about the Your World podcast and what don't you like? And one of the things that we learned is that over time, we'd gotten very comfortable with the longer format for the podcast. Um, the podcast, and the number sounds crazy to most people, ran between 45 minutes to an hour, uh, which is a lot of time invested in podcasting, but they're a lot of fun to do, so whatever. But players provided the feedback that they wanted them to be shorter. And this is where the use of secondary feedback came in really handy. Because telling us that they want them shorter isn't perfect. So we generally leave an area for subjective feedback so players can write it in. And the explanation that we got from players was brilliant. And their explanation was, I drive to work, and it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to drive to work. So I want the podcast to be between 10 and 15 minutes in length. So when I get up the day that the podcast release, I can get in the car, listen to the podcast, and drive to work. Awesome takeaway from players, right? Because what they told us is, one, you're wasting your time. Uh, you know, you've got four people who are sort of involved in the whole podcast process. So that's basically three hours of just lost work every week that we didn't need to be doing. Um, but also that they would be high, more highly engaged with something that took them less time uh, and that they listened to on their commute. And what happens is they, they listen to the podcast on their way to work and then they're thinking about the game throughout the day and you're keeping them engaged, right? So here's some examples of player-generated content. This is based on player feedback that we've received. Um, what we actually do, some of our players, um, and you guys will find this actually with your player bases as well, a lot of players are remarkably talented uh, and are able to actually put together decent quality content. Um, your world, stylistically, um, look, it shows its age. <laughs> We've been around for eight years. However, there are advantages to being an older game because our style is fairly simple to follow, right? So that means that players, like amateur artists, can create art that they want to see in game and then we can generate that art based on it. Um, so this is all player generated content that was submitted to us by different players. Um, and what we found is that the player generated content that we receive is actually 20% more effective than any of the other content that we release. Now part of that is driven by exclusivity because it does tend to run for a shorter period of time. But the other part is because players feel a sense of ownership and they have actually voted on these designs through the contest system, they feel a sense of obligation to support the things that they've shown their support for up to this point, uh, which is really, really awesome. So this is one of our player report cards. Um, and what you'll see, this is a very basic look at one of the player report cards. But what you'll see here uh, is we ask them how our customer service efforts are going and how effectively we're communicating with them. Now, when you look at this survey, assume that this survey is about 20 times longer than what you're seeing right now, and the rest just won't fit on the screen. Um, but what we do is we always measure the three values. Um, you'll hear me interchangeably refer to them as yo values, uh, which is what we refer to them as players, and pillars, which is what we refer to them as as in-house, uh, but we'll always measure those with players. In the last three months, do you feel like the game has been as safe and secure as you would expect it to be? In the last three months, how effectively have we been engaging you as a community? And in the last three months, how effective have you been in creating content and how can we help you create more content? Uh, which is really, really useful information to have. 
So one of the big things with the engagement surveys uh, is that coming up with new ideas isn't always easy, but we have this awesome resource in our players, and we know a lot of potential content generators. We know people who can actually fill our coffers with ideas when our well is starting to run a little bit dry, um, which definitely happens with the live ops game. Uh, and we can find out exactly what it is that they want, and then we can deliver on it. Uh, as I mentioned, the demographic surveys revealed a need for more female content. So what we did is we surveyed the players about what feminine meant to them and how we could better deliver on quote unquote female content. We took that, or that uh, feedback and we actioned on it. Um, the design contests, as I mentioned, are also really effective. Um, one of the important things to note here uh, is to beware of the vocal minority. Uh, that is one of the dangers in engaging communities. Uh, when you're dealing with large groups of players, uh, say you have 100,000 players, it's very easy for a small group of players to railroad a conversation and over-represent the size of their population through posting. Uh, and that's why you want to use validation through stick, strict data when the conversation takes a turn on you. Uh, so another thing that we do is post-release or post-release surveys. Um, what we do as an organization is we look at every release we do as an opportunity to improve. Every single time we push content out to players, that's an opportunity to do better next time. Uh, now we don't do a survey every single time we release content, that would be far too cumbersome. Uh, but what we do is we release uh, to our most engaged players uh, a forum post, because we do still use forums, and we ask them, what did you like about this release? What didn't you like this release? And how are we going to do better? If that sounds very agile, that is the way that we operate. We are an agile shop, so we're always looking to iterate and improve on the things that we're working on. Um, and when we do those, we always make sure that we measure both objective and subjective feedback, um, because having players provide yes or no answers is great. Having them answer multiple cho choice questions is also great, but you need some context for where those answers are coming from. Um, and then what we do is after that release, we'll plan our future releases based on feedback and data. Um, now, if that sounds complicated, it is. Uh, we move at a very fast pace, uh, but it's very worthwhile because one of the reasons that we've seen such rapid growth is using the feedback of players to constantly iterate and improve on the things that we're doing. So this is just a, a real quick glance uh, of a feedback forum thread uh, from players on a bundle that went out. Um, you can see one of our community managers posted, what do you guys think about the stuff that was released today? Um, and players responded. Now, as I mentioned, it's actually pretty difficult to get a lot of information on a tiny screen. Um, but what I'll point out is that there's two sort of side-by-sides here. You've got the forum post on the one side, and then on the other side, we actually have our measured data uh, with the numbers removed for the sales figures. So what we'll do is we'll ask players how they feel about things, we'll get the response, and our community managers will feed that back up to us uh, in production, and then we will take that fed back data and compare it to the actual data that we're receiving on sales and make sure that the two gel. Uh, because one of the things that our players have learned, thank goodness, it's awesome, uh, is that they can back up their opinions with their wallets, which can be dangerous if they don't like things, but very, very good if they do. So as I mentioned, when you're measuring your feedback, always make sure that you're validating uh, your feedback with data. Um, using things like sales figures and participation numbers uh, and other analytics data is really, really, really critical. Um, and make sure that you're creating feedback and improvement loops for your team. Um, if you're not validating data, you definitely should be uh, because one, if you're getting subjective feedback from all of your players, especially if you're dealing with a large scale title, you can't go through it fast enough. There's just too much information. And that's when you're gonna need really objective feedback. But if you need more clarity, that's when you get into the subjective stuff. So, how do you decide what to listen to? That's a tough question. Um, every player has an opinion, um, but not all feedback is created equally, interestingly enough. Um, some players, we actually, we make a point of knowing our players really well with, um, with a relatively large player base that can be challenging, but our community managers happen to be particularly good at knowing who people are. Uh, and we have certain players who we know will complain, no matter what we do. Every single day they'll complain about something, nothing's ever good enough. And that's when you get to the point where, okay, we just kind of discard your feedback. We still kind of hear it, but it becomes more white noise 
Um, and we try and train our players to behave in ways that we want them to behave. Um, and what that means is teaching them that there are good types of feedback and bad types of feedback. They can provide feedback in a constructive context, but they need to know how. Uh, we also try to balance the player feedback with long-term objectives. Um, that can be very challenging when you have outside influences um, on your product, for example, that players don't necessarily understand um, that you have to deal with, right? Um, so, for example, if you have uh, regulatory compliance, uh, which doesn't happen to a lot of people, uh, I know it definitely happens uh, in a lot more casino games, uh, but if you have things like that, or you have external stakeholders, or you have a technological requirement that you need to meet, uh, for example, we did a large server transition uh, because we were dealing with a seven-year-old server infrastructure uh, that just didn't make sense anymore. Players do have a difficult time understanding that. Um, and that's where your communication is going to come in key. Uh, because the long-term objective is to provide better server infrastructure so that you can provide them better features in the long term, but you need to be able to communicate that to them effectively. Uh, also, as I mentioned, pay close attention to your sample size. Don't let 1,000 people out of 100,000 drive your decision making. Um, they will if they can, uh, so make sure that you're maintaining control. So while this is a wall of text, this is a very good example of very helpful player feedback. Um, first of all, the, the player's name's been blacked out because safe and secure is one of our values, so if they wind up watching this, I got you. Um, one of the really important things that this player told us uh, is that they felt that the color use could be improved uh, in items. So what that means is that we can provide that feedback to our artists and say, you know, one of our top supporting players feels like color use is off right now. Can you take a look at the last batch of stuff that's like, this is five minutes of work, right? Take a look at the last batch of releases, make sure that everything is actually on palette because when, for a decorating game in particular, if you have 10 or 12 artists that are all working towards decorating a room but they're all making uh, their pieces sort of in isolation, you're gonna wind up with color mismatches if you're not really, really careful. So we always listen to that feedback. Um, secondly, the player pointed out that pricing seems high. And this was really good feedback for us because the player was interestingly both right and wrong. Um, based on this player's feedback, and I'm gonna note that if you take a look at this post, this post had 100 replies to it with 70% of the replies supporting the post. We don't just take one long forum post and say, okay, this person's got great ideas, let's dive right in. Um, but what we do is we say, okay, if there's a lot of support, we're gonna look at it. The pricing feedback that we received uh, in this instance was that prices are higher than they used to be and everything's more expensive. The player was wrong about that. The average price of the items in that theme had actually gone down about five to six percent. But the player was also right because the number of items that went out during that theme had increased by 20 to 30 percent. So organically, by process of playing the game, the player innately had an understanding of the total cost of ownership of the theme, right? It just felt like it was costing more. And having that kind of feedback, having feedback from players where they're like, this doesn't feel the way it used to feel, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, but it's valuable to listen to. Uh, and finally, the, the player also said that we're doing too much of the same thing. Uh, if you take a look at the post, if you can find it, it's down near the bottom. Too many rugs, too many lamps, too many couches. That's great feedback. Um, because what that says to us based on player feedback and there being supporting evidence from other players is that we should be taking a look into our sales figures directly for those items and finding out whether or not their sales are on the decline. If they're on the decline, then we're wasting effort on doing them and we can be making better offerings that make the players happier and make us generate more profit at the same time. So how do you get them to talk? Um, contrary to popular belief, not everybody wants to share their opinion. Uh, and sometimes you have to encourage them to do so. Uh, so sometimes what we need to do is we actually need to incentivize our players to engage us in conversation. Uh, and sometimes we actually need to start that conversation ourselves. Uh, one of the things that I'll point out is that rewarding players is highly, highly effective. Um, rewards do not have to be large. They can be very small things. Uh, and a reward can be something as simple as a thank you. Just telling players that you appreciate the feedback and you're gonna look into it is a reward for some people. Um, but using rewards, I'll point out, our nor uh, most normal survey response rates for games that we've worked on are about 40%, um, which is, that's not bad. 
that's enough to get an idea. Uh, in your world, our average response rate is actually 63%, um, and that's because of the engagement effort. However, with rewards, our response rate goes up over 90%. Uh, for something as simple as an item that could take an artist an hour to make, all of a sudden we've increased the effectiveness of our data significantly. Uh, so here's an example of how we sort of showed off our newsletter to our players. Um, and what we did is you can see on the right hand side, we incentivized it with a peacock hat, which is literally just a peacock that stands on top of your head. Um, but players love the item, so uh, the sign up rate for our newsletter was over 70%, uh, just through that incentivization. And the amazing thing about that for me uh, is that we had created a separate channel of communication for players outside of the game, which is one of the biggest challenges everybody has, is how do you talk to them when they're not playing? Um, as a, just as an aside, if you're gonna do a newsletter for your game, um, I highly encourage you not to make it a sales initiative. Make it about communicating with players. You can put sales stuff in there, but if you're only sending them another ad once a week to buy stuff, they're gonna unsubscribe really quickly. So rewarding player behavior uh, is really important. Uh, we tend to use small tokens and character adornments uh, because we find that they're highly effective. One of the things I like to compare it to is if you think about the rock the vote badges that you can get when you vote, it's the same idea. It's a way for people to let other people know that their voice was heard and that they contributed. Uh, so it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be big. It can be something small. It's just a matter of making it. Uh, and especially if you make it exclusive, it's all the more valuable. Uh, also, always show your gratitude and appreciation for player feedback. Never stop saying thank you. Everything they have to say even if it's terrible and mean and awful, is valuable. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, most of the time, you also want to make sure that you're rewarding after and not before, which makes a ton of sense, right? If you want your kid to clean their room, you're not going to give them a chocolate, board, uh, chocolate bar before they clean the room. You're going to do it after, because otherwise you're just going to have a chocolated up kid <laughs> in the dirty room. Uh, so here's an example of one of the ways that we use feedback in a sales context that we actually find very, very effective. And this is what we call a you asked, we listened. Um, and this is part of a larger brand strategy that we use for the players to let them know that we're listening to their feedback uh, while also presenting them with items for sale. Uh, and this is a great scenario because uh, if you look at the two hairs that are here, um, these are both player designed hairs that we released. Uh, and the player feedback that we got was we would like more colors for these hairs, if you please, because the color selection is great, but uh, we think that there could be more. It's real hard to say no when people want to buy more of your content. Uh, so we have a tendency to give in uh, and just make that content for them. Uh, and then we'll package it up in one of these you ask, we listens, which is a standard format. Uh, and players respond really, real, really well to them, sorry. So how do we know that this works? It's a good question, Jacob. Thank you. Uh, so our DAE growth is currently about 30% of one back players. Um, and that's important to us, because the players that have grown uh, our actual daily active users are players who used to play Yeovil, got fed up and left, and then have heard from their friends that things have changed and things are better, so now it's time to come back. That's great, because these people also tend to be highly engaged players, and they're going to be contributing to the communication that we get back. Uh, also, on average, as I mentioned, the items that were created uh, based on player feedback do perform 20% better, uh, and our ARP DAO is up almost 40%. Um, I can't go into direct numbers, but the product more than pays for itself um, just by way of keeping communication open with players. So here's some of the added benefits to actually doing this. Um, caring can really help engage your players with your team. Uh, and more importantly, caring engages your team with your players, and that's a hard thing to do for some titles. Um, how many people here work on a live ops title right now? So, some, so anybody who works on a live ops title knows that live operations can be a grind, right? Especially if you're highly content driven. It does sometimes feel like an unending treadmill. Um, the way that you can break yourself out of that cycle is to find a way to communicate with your players and really care about them because then you're making content for your friends, right? Then you're building stuff for people who love what you're doing uh, and have your back as well. Uh, and that's a really good way to keep the flame burning between the team and yourself uh, and the players. Uh, so this is one of our community managers. This is Trevor. Um, Trevor is actually drinking in uh, coffee 
uh, out of a mug that was sent to us by players. Uh, the postcard wall that you see behind him is all postcards sent by players, and the coffee in that mug is also coffee that was sent to us by players. Uh, Trevor's very brave. I wouldn't drink the coffee, uh, but Trevor would. Um, so good job, Trevor. Um, how many community managers do we have in the room? Thank you. If anybody hasn't said that to you in the last month, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you do. If you work with a community manager, um, thank them today. If you can't thank them today, thank them tomorrow, but thank them. The amount of hard work that community managers do to bridge the gap between us and our players and provide that feedback in a meaningful context while keeping a smile on their face and dealing with sometimes very frustrating situations is immeasurable. Uh, so make sure that you're thanking them. Give them a hug. They deserve it. Um, so the takeaways for today, number one, always remember the human side of gaming. Uh, one of the things I try to remind myself of, the first thing I do when I get into the office in the morning, is why did I start down this road? Why did I want to make video games? Because I love them, okay? So why are people playing our games? Because they love them, right? They're, they're not just another number on a spreadsheet. They're real living, breathing people who are looking for an exciting and engaging experience that we can help deliver to them. Um, and that will help drive your passion for building games for years if you can find a way to engage with players on that level. Um, also find out who your players are and what engages them. Um, don't make assumptions based on the data that you have. Actually ask them who they are, where they're from, what they did, as long as they love you. Um, also create pillars and standards that you and your players will understand. Um, and that's just for driving communication in an effective manner. Uh, so behavior modeling is really important when it comes to dealing with player bases. So if players are behaving in a way that is really admirable, make sure that you're rewarding that. If they're providing feedback to a survey, great, reward that. If you have one player that goes out of their way to help other players, it can be as simple as recognizing that and saying, this player is awesome, they do what we want them to do. That encourages the other players who are in the same, you know, who are sort of in the same situation and thinking of helping other people to take that next step and become helpful, and it drives community. Um, also make sure that you're making players a big part of the team. Um, they have so much to offer, don't leave that on the table. Uh, so caveats, really important. Um, always remember that if you're engaging your players in an effective way, you're essentially giving them agency over your title. You're still gonna be in charge, but they're helping drive that decision making. Uh, so agency can really easily breed passion, and passion can very easily be misinterpreted as anger. Um, make sure you're not taking it too personally, uh, and beware of the vocal minority, uh, because they can break through if they really want to. Um, and just maintain control of the conversation. Uh, ultimately, you get to decide how you engage with your players. If people are being overly toxic, you don't have to continue to engage in that conversation. Uh, you can give them timeouts, it's okay. Um, also find ways to keep the players busy and engaged. One of the things that we've found most effective with engaging the players on a day-to-day -day basis is keeping them busy by way of games, by way of social interaction, uh, and by way of designing stuff. And what that does is it takes away the potential for boredom. Uh, if they're in an idle state and they're not actively playing the game, but they are still interacting with the community, boredom can sometimes feed drama because they're bored and they're looking to start a fight because they're looking to be entertained by anything, right? So if you're finding ways to keep them entertained, you're gonna nip that in the bud right away. Um, don't take feedback personally. As hard as it possibly is, try not to take feedback personally. One of the challenging things, quite frankly, uh, in developing games is that we pour our lives and our passion into games. Um, you know, nobody who works in games is a stranger to 12 or 14 hour days. We've all been through crunches. We've all poured everything that we have into a title. And to have somebody come along and tell you that the work that you've done isn't good enough can be really hurtful. But what you need to remember is that where that player is coming from is that they care very much about the game that you've made. Remember that that anger is far better than indifference, because uh, an indifferent player is basically a dead player and they're gonna be leaving very soon. Uh, so remember that if they're coming at it really passionately, they're coming at it from a place of truth, uh, and make sure that you support that. And finally, just have clear-cut rules of engagement uh, and be consistent in your follow-through. 
Um, make sure that the rules always apply to all players. Nobody is above the law. Uh, that is a thing that we've dealt with in that um, some of our platinum supporters, our high tier supporters, will sometimes feel like their opinion matters more than other players. Uh, don't tell them, of course it kind of does um, in a way, in that when it comes to sales and stuff, we'll listen to it, but when it comes to the treatment of other players, no way. Safe and secure is our number one yo value and we always go back to it. And that's it. Questions? I apologize if you covered this and I just didn't hear, but how do you sure. feel about compensating players for user-generated content? How do, you, how do you go about it? That's a fantastic question. I actually didn't go directly into it. Um, so the question, just so to make sure everybody heard, is how do we feel about compensating for user-generated content? Uh, we're generally in favor of it, uh, but the compensation tends to be an in-game currency. Um, one of the issues with compensating people, especially when they're across the world, is that sending direct money doesn't necessarily work. Uh, so we will do it in in-game currency. The nice thing is that most of our players who are generating that content uh, are actually pretty active players who are into spending. So to them, it's a fair trade. They're, they are getting money in that they're not investing money in the game for the next little bit. And do you use soft currency or hard currency? We have two currencies. So, uh, you so give them the we give them the hard currency, yeah. Stuff, yeah. Absolutely. Right, cool, thanks. Hey. Um. So at one point you mentioned, uh, for example, uh, trying to convey to users the importance of server downtime that you had. Um, is there a, a place where you draw the line between like um, revealing information that is useful to them versus saying too much? Is yes. there a line there? Yes. Mm. Uh, the problem with that line is that it is ever shifting. Um, we Part of it is based on what we know we can tell them and what we know we can't tell them. And I know that that's a really vague answer. Um, but so for example, server downtime, where we're like, the server architecture is old, it needs to be upgraded because our server calls are taking 35 milliseconds and we would like them to take 0.2 milliseconds. <laughs> Players don't necessarily understand when you speak technically, but then you're just like, that's a thousand times faster. And they're like, okay, everything's faster. That's the thing we can communicate effectively. Um, but when it comes to, um, and I have to tiptoe around this a little bit. Uh, you may have noticed it during the talk, I was tiptoeing around a little bit. When it comes to certain things that you have projects on the go that have to deal with the title that you can't necessarily talk about, uh, that's where it does get more difficult. Um, as an example, right now, we have a number of our developers working on sort of a secret project for Yo World that players can't know about um, just because if we told them about it, they may react in a way that we didn't want. Uh, and part of it is knowing how the players are going to react as well, right? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you have any tips on how to send uh, surveys to the right people? Because we had, uh, there was a time we sent a service to a thousand people and only three people responded. So okay. how would you uh, gauge like who, how do you filter who to send and to get the valuable information? Sure. Uh, so the question was, how do you filter uh, the surveys that you're sending out to people uh, to make sure that you're getting meaningful information and sending stuff to the right people? Uh, that in and of itself is a bit of an iterative process. Um, and we, we have come at this over time, right? Uh, so step one for us uh, was getting a server, uh, survey infrastructure in place that we could actually make use of. Uh, so there's a number of tools that we had to build along the way, uh, but we've measured, uh, it's like, for example, sales data tends to be really good for basic demographic data, right? You're gonna have basic sales data on all of your players. Uh, so one of the things that we'll do is we have our players broken down into, I believe it's eight tiers, uh, eight different spend tiers. Uh, so we will send out surveys to the eight different spend tiers and just ask them questions uh, based on their tier of spend. Um, and what you can do is then you can measure your response rate within tiers, right? One of the things that we know is that our highest tier of spender actually tends to be highly responsive. So if we have something that we absolutely need information on, then we'll actually go to our high tier spenders um, and just ask for feedback that way. Um, as I said, you know, if, you're, if your response rate is about 3%, 
Um, rewarding is going to help you a lot with that, um, depending on the style of game. Uh, not all games allow for certain rewards. Um, but, I mean, we've done rewards even where we've done hard and soft currency as the reward um, to get response rates up. Uh, and part of that is the behavior modeling that I talked about of teaching them that you appreciate them taking the time that you value it as well. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, looks like that's it. Thanks, guys.